Good evening, and welcome to worship this morning. It's great to have you here in, our, in worship tonight for our midweek Lenten service as we continue with our series our, for, the, for the Lenten season, the words Jesus spoke from the cross. And tonight we look at um, the theme word, words would be, he spoke a word of absolute anguish, and we'll look at that in the sermon tonight. So with that, we follow our order of service as printed out for us, also up on the overhead, and we begin with our opening hymn, Jesus, I Will Ponder Now.
we stand. O oh Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O oh God. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, you have brought us safely to this hour of evening prayer. We thank you for providing all that we need for body and life. Bless us who have gathered in your name, forgive our sins, speak to our hearts, dispel our sorrows with the comfort of your word, and receive our hymns of thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, our living Savior, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the Passion History. Those who had arrested Jesus brought him to the high priest's house where the scribes and elders were assembled. Peter followed from afar off and so did another disciple. That disciple was known to the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest, but Peter stood outside at the door. So that the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. He went in and sat with the servants to see the end. He was warming himself at the fire they had kindled in the middle of the courtyard. Meanwhile, the chief priests and the whole council were seeking evidence that might make the case for a death sentence, but they could not find any. Many bore false witness against him, but their statements did not agree. Two stepped forward and said, We heard him say, I shall destroy this temple made with hands, and after three days I shall build another not made with hands. But even on this point, their evidence did not agree. Then the high priest stood up, moved to the center, and put this question to Jesus. Do you have no answer? What is this evidence they have given against you? But he was silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest put a question to him and said, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of God's power and coming with the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his garments and said, Do we still need any witnesses? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your opinion? They all agreed that he was deserving of death. Then some of them began to spit on him. They blindfolded him, struck him, and said to him, Prophesy to us, O Christ, who is it that struck you? The guards beat him as they took him away. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. One of the maidservants of the high priest came and saw Peter warming himself. She looked at him closely as he sat in the light of the fire and said, You also were along with the man from Nazareth, that Jesus. Peter denied it and said, I do, know not, do not know what you mean. He went out to the forecourt then. Another maidservant saw him there and said to those who were standing around, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Peter denied it again with an oath, I do not know the man. A little later, those standing around said to Peter, Surely you are one of them. You are a Galilean. Your accent gives you away. Peter started calling down curses on himself and swore, I do not know the man. And immediately while he was still speaking, the cock crowed a second time, and the Lord turned and looked on Peter. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. Peter broke down and went out and wept bitterly. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests with the elders and the scribes held the court session with all the Sanhedrin. Then they bound him, led him away, and turned him over to Pilate. Then Judas, who had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, was sorry and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned, <clears throat> I have betrayed innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? That is your affair. Jesus, Judas threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed. He went and hanged himself. The chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. They took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. That is why to this day that field has been called the field of blood. In this way was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by the children of Israel, and gave them for the potter's field. This is our reading from the Passion History. 
All we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed. We join in singing our theme hymn, Jesus in Your Dying Wool, verses 10, 11, and 12. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue this Lenten series tonight. Seven times he spoke with these theme words. He spoke a word of absolute anguish. Our texts for tonight come from two gospel readings. They're the only two gospel readings that record these words pretty much the same. From Mark 15, verse 34, And at the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthini, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthini, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is our text, dear friends in Christ. Of the seven words Jesus spoke from the cross, this fourth word is the only one that's recorded in both Matthew and Mark. It's not recorded in the other ones. Why this divine repetition for this word? It is because these words seem so unbelievable. The Bible could record these words a hundred times, even a thousand times, and we would still, we just wouldn't be able to fathom these words when we really think about it. And tonight we want to ponder the words of which Dr. Martin Luther once wrote and said, God forsaken of God, who can understand it? When Jesus spoke this word, he spoke this word of absolute anguish. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with that loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did you know Now when Jesus spoke this word of anguish that he was quoting Psalm 22 verse 1. I encourage you this Lenten season sometime during it whenever to go home and to read that Psalm, Psalm 22. Read through the whole thing. Though David penned those words some thousand years earlier than this time frame when Jesus was on the cross, it sounds more like a journalist's on the scenes report of the Good Friday horrors. This is how Matthew and Mark recorded it, as we heard in our text. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. The ninth hour. That's the way the Jews figured time. Starting first with time beginning for the Jews at 6 a.m. In Roman time, that is in our time, the time of the sixth hour was 3 p.m. our time. Jesus had hung on the cross for some six hours already. He was crucified at the third hour at nine in the morning. Have any of you ever seen the movie, Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of Christ? It does a really good job of depicting and showing us the brutality of crucifixion. That Passion of Christ, if you've seen it, you've witnessed the brutal, the gory depiction 
of the horrors of crucifixion, and he does a great job in that movie, and sometimes it's really hard to watch. I've watched it, I watch it every year trying to help myself go back and remember what our Savior went through. And if you watch it and you see that, it's one of those things that you won't soon forget. But it happened. But any study of Christ's crucifixion, whether you watch it on a video like that or not, or you just read it out of Scripture, even out of Scripture, it gets very intense. What did Jesus endure physically in those six hours? Well, we know before he was put on that cross, there was the scourging Pilate had done, the crown of thorns that was pressed into his scalp, the beating with the staff on his head on that crown of thorns, driving those thorns deeper into his scalp, and even hitting him on the face and around the face while they're doing this and that. They hit him over and over and over again. The soldiers, they spit on him. They put a purple robe on him. And then they took that robe off of him. They ripped that robe from his body. That alone had to hurt when you think about it, if it's, you know, when you've, when you've cut yourself or, or scraped yourself and if your clothing gets stuck to that as it scabs over, think about Jesus and his back. That had to have hurt when they ripped that off his body. Almost like having a bandage ripped off when you're trying to check a wound. And all this took place, that stuff took place before he was ever nailed to the cross through his wrists and his feet and then hung upon that cross, stuck up and let it drop down into a hole to hold it up and jarring him. All of that's done before that crucifixion point. Many a prisoner had died before they ever got to the crucifixion from the beating that they took prior to that, to that torture beforehand. But Jesus survived all of that torture to be nailed to that cross and to suffer the horrors of crucifixion. What was it like? Well, David gives us a peek into his Savior's mind, again from Psalm 22, starting with verse 14. David saw that it wasn't very pretty. He said, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men have encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. What Jesus suffered physically that day in the beating and torture before and then the crucifixion would make any of us cry out as well. But Jesus' agony went much deeper than just the physical agony that he did, had to endure. Notice he didn't say, Father in heaven, why are you letting them torture, this, torture me like this and be mean to me? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Impossible words when you think about it. Because you see, for the first time in his life, Jesus didn't address his Lord as Father. He couldn't. The Father had abandoned his Son hanging on that cross. There is distance in this cry. There is loneliness in this cry. No one was there. No help whatsoever. For Jesus, these last hours on the cross were hell on earth. This was the cry of absolute anguish. Why? It's not that hard for us to answer, is it? We know exactly why the Son was abandoned by the Father, as we hear in Ecclesiastes 7, because there is not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. The whole sins of the whole world, all sins of all time, of all people, were laid upon Jesus at that point in time, the perfect Passover lamb, to bear and to have and to pay for, and the reality of it was God the Father couldn't look upon sin and does not look upon sin as he is righteous and just and holy. He turned away from his son. Why did Jesus lose his father's love at this point? Because you and I, gathered here tonight along with all people, had forsaken our first love.
Because there are those days you and I gathered here when we are lukewarm at best, and sometimes we're even cold for our Lord. We're downright cold, and somebody had to be punished for those times when we sin and when we don't stand up for Jesus and we walk away and we renounce him at times and we do these sins. Somebody had to be punished. And Paul tells us in Galatians, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming that curse for us. Jesus took the full brunt of God's punishment for you and for me and for all people of all time. He took their sins to that cross. From the sixth hour, Scripture tells us, until the ninth hour, darkness came over all of the land. This is the only detail of that three-hour time period in the time of the Gospels. That's because this darkness was no mere coincidence. Did you know that ancient records from Rome and Greece and Egypt and as far away as China make mention of this three-hour period of darkness? It covered the whole land. Jesus spoke this word of absolute anguish because of you and me. We were part of that. And praise be to God, our Father, that Jesus spoke this word of absolute anguish instead of you and I having to speak that. God had warned what would happen to those who would betray him by sinning. Through the prophet Ezekiel, the Lord declares in Ezekiel 18, he says, the soul who sins is the one who will die. The wickedness of the wicked will be charged against him. And that charge for sin is death in hell. Scripture tells us that. But Jesus endured God the Father's punishment of hell in our place. That hell was right there on the cross. Why? Because our Savior didn't want us to have to find out what it would be like to have to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He didn't want us to have to know what it was like to gnash our teeth through an eternity of hell, knowing that it was our own fault, knowing that it was our own stubbornness and stupidity and spiritual apathy that would have landed us there. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Our perfect substitute spoke these words so that we'd never have to say those words and we would never have to endure God's wrath. He paid the price for our sins in full because he knew that you and I could never pay for them. The result? Well, the words of Isaiah the prophet come to mind in Isaiah 54. It says this, For a brief moment I abandoned you, but with deep compassion I will bring you back. In a surge of anger I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have compassion on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. To me, this is like the days of Noah when I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you, never to rebuke you again. Though, my, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be re removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who had compassion on you. Moments after Jesus cried out those words of anguish, absolute anguish, my God, my God, why? Our Savior also proclaimed, it is finished. Though the time on that cross must have felt, felt like an eternity <clears throat> to Jesus, it lasted just but a few hours. But it was hell on earth for him he had to suffer through. And thanks be to God then that it was over then. It was finished. Jesus had paid the price the price for salvation was complete. The storm surge of the Father's anger against sin was washed away in the greater flood of his son's holy blood that was shed on that cross. The covenant of peace was cemented in place by that holy sacrifice of God's son. The anguish Christ suffered as sin bearer for the whole world was complete. It was over. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, we can read those words a million times and we still won't fully understand and comprehend them because of what Jesus has said and done for us. We will never have to. 
Thank God for that. Amen. <clears throat> now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in true faith in Christ Jesus, our suffering Savior. Amen. stand for prayer. Almighty God, whose beloved Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, not to his glory before he embraced a cross, plant his cross in our hearts that in its power and love we may come to the joyful end of our faith and a heavenly crown. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we give you most humble and hearty thanks that you have given your only begotten Son to bear our sins and to make atonement for us on the cross. We pray that by your grace, you would grant us to put our whole trust in his redemption, that our faith in you would be strengthened and our souls comforted, and that we be enabled to resist all the assaults of sin. Protect us. Protect us against the devices of the evil one. In all temptations, keep us by your Holy Spirit and help us to walk according to your word that being guarded and defended by your mighty power, we may never depart from your ways, but in the end be saved by your grace. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace with the, which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated as we sing our closing hymn, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted. <laughs>